you said I'm the king of nuggets. I'm the king of nuggets for which I cannot remember the reference. <laughs> so right, right I heard once. Yeah, right before we started, Brian, you were telling me a nugget about thinking. Why don't you take take a stab at it? Drop me some sure. Nuggets. Well, the, the nugget was that um, you know the part of our brain that controls, um, you know, like that gut instinct response doesn't control language. And so when someone says, "I can't," I just can't, uh, you know, explain why, but I know it's wrong. It's because the part of your brain that knows it's wrong is not the part that controls the language to explain it. So I love brain stuff. I just don't know enough about it. I love it. And you have a friend that actually is like expert in this type of neurology. You want to, you want to start name oh, dropping? Yeah. yeah. He's a neuroscience researcher. Um, Dr. CK Bray of the Dr. CK Bray show. Nice. Um, also prolific pickleball player. Um, yeah, neuroscience researcher. It's funny when we talk, he says, yeah, I'm really looking for a new hire. I need someone with like corporate experience, MBA or doctorate or um, and, you know, also like a neuroscientist. So if you know any of those people, <laughs> let me know. Let him know. Yeah. Audience, if you're out there, if you've got corporate experience, you've got your MBA and you're a neuroscientist. Dr. C.K. Like, what can I do thing. with all of this? Yeah. The, uh, there's seems to be no doors opening for me. And you're working Dr. in construction. Dr. C.K. Bray has a spot for you. Yeah. Yes. Wait, and you're working in construction and you listen to this podcast. Yeah. Dr. Exactly. C.K. Bray. That we'll put a link to the show so you can get a hold yes. of him so we can help help the, the good doctor fill that need. Welcome to the EBFC show, the easier, better for construction podcast. I'm your host, Felipe Engineer Manriquez. This show is all about the business of construction. Today's episode is sponsored by Bosch Refine My Site is a cloud-based construction collaboration platform that applies lean principles to enable your entire team to plan, communicate, and execute in real time. It's the digital tool that works in tandem with your last planner system process and puts it all together in one simple collaborative ecosystem system. This easy to use platform is available in English, German, Spanish, Portuguese, and French and can be used on desktops, tablets, and mobile devices. According to Spencer Easton, scheduling manager at Oakland Construction, Refine My Site, in my opinion, is the best, leanest tool on the market for the last time it's Here's what our users have to say. We've looked at three other digital scheduling platforms and none compare to the straightforward approach Refund My Site takes. From milestone planning all the way down to daily tasks, this program gives every general contractor and their trade partners meaningful collaboration, accountability, and KPIs. Register today to try Refund My Site for free for 60 days. Today's show is also sponsored by the Lean Construction Institute. LCI is working to lead the building industry in transforming its practices and culture. Its vision is to create a healthy and thriving industry that delivers outstanding project outcomes every time for everyone. Check the show notes for more information. Now, to the show. Welcome to the show, Brian Melcher. Brian Melcher, my brother from another mother. You have a I'm special a place right here that you have even no idea. Our friendship is so tight, so close. Where have you been all my life when we first met on LinkedIn first, and then later we met in real life abroad? You're one of the first friends abroad. I've ever met abroad that lived in yeah, the U.S. you're my European friend yeah. <laughs> in the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. That, is, that makes it even cooler. It is cool because, you know, we can talk about how we met and be condescending to others at the same time. Fast friends and then brothers. Well, you're a great example of people first. From my perspective, I'm on a boat in, and we Googled this, we're in the Baltic Sea, right? Is that where we were? We were in the Baltic Sea, somewhere off the coast of Sweden. In the Baltic Sea, somewhere off the coast of Sweden, I'm in the small boat piloted by the one, the only, Nicholas Modig, in full Swedish regala, and we're pulling up and... And I see in the distance a taxi dropping off a person with a single bag. And I'm thinking, a single bag. Yep. Single bag. This guy knows how to travel. This is somebody that I need to know and I need to shut up and listen and talk to. And I, we, we docked the boat. I have no knot tying skills yet, but I'm still young, Brian. I can learn. And so I was free to receive you and welcome you to the boat. And I think we hugged right away. Did we not? Oh, we hugged. Yep. You put two huggers 
even in a different country in proximity and there would be hugging. <laughs> you didn't mention the swans though. The, the craziest thing is there's just these majestic swans in the ocean. Did you even know swans went? I don't know where I thought swans went. Like in lakes waiting for fairy tales. Yeah. Um, you know, they're ugly, stay there for a while. And then I guess they go to Sweden and just float around on the ocean. So yeah. that was pretty crazy to see, too. That was eye opening. We're like, Nicholas is telling us, watch out for the swans. It's like, no, you're driving. Oh, man. this is a thing. Yeah. Okay. You watch out for the swans. I'm over here spectating. Right. Like, what's going to happen? No, no animals were harmed in the forming of our friendship. <laughs> it was, it was a sight to see every time. You're totally right. Every time I'd, I'd get lost looking into the water and just seeing swans swimming. And they're always like, they never saw one swan by themselves. They're always in pairs, yes. at least, at least in pairs. Swans swimming in Sweden. Yep. Five say, times fast. Yeah. Say that really fast. Please introduce yourself to the good people of the EBFC show. I'm Brian Melcher. Um, I run Field Verified in Phoenix, Arizona. We are building envelope consultants. Uh, we are an accredited field testing agency. We have an accredited laboratory. And um, we have a building enclosure management training course that is now open to the world as well. Congratulations, Brian. Thank you. That is what we do. Who we are is just a great collection of people. Um, I, I walked in to, uh, I'm ruining my own introduction. I walked in and got one of these acai bowls. It's like the only one, someone should open one up near my house because the only one <laughs> near my house is terribly run. And I stood there watching all of this. And I'm like, man, with some lean principles, I could bring in three people from my team, get 30 <laughs> minutes of training, document the whole thing and run this place the best it's ever been run and have time to be personable and friendly and all the things that I felt like I was lacking as I, tried to get peanut butter on top of my wife's acai bowl. It was oh. the only thing she needed that day. Really, it was the only thing I felt like I could provide <laughs> accurately. <laughs> so it became very important. I've never tried peanut butter on acai. I think that's something that we need to do the next time I'm in town. So I run Field Verified, which is a collection of just incredible people. Uh, we, I think, would be good at anything we set our minds to. Uh, with what we've learned, but we are very good at building enclosure. And uh, we love the training program. We we realized a while ago that what we enjoy most is teaching and seeing people be successful. And so it's not easy to put together training content, period. Uh, there's no precedent for this. And, um, and then to cater it to the construction industry, because we're not training consultants. We are training people on how to manage a building enclosure and manage all the processes that lead into it to manage the construction, the people, manage the people involved in the construction. Uh, so even a focus on soft skills, but hands-on, you can see behind me here, some of our artwork. It's like when the kindergarten kids get to put their artwork on the wall, yeah. or, you know, my kids at home. Uh, these are hands-on mock-ups that uh, those in attendance get to build. And we used to store them and, you know, here's some lean for you. We used to store them in giant containers and then pull them out for each day. And then we realized they look pretty cool if you hang them on the wall and you don't have to store them and you just go and grab yours off when it's time to build on it some more. It was great having you here and, uh, you know, you described your new book, which I yeah. think you told me to mention three times. Shameless plug. Here it is right here. In case you didn't Shameless know. Shameless plug. I've already, I've already like jacked it open and creased it real good. Oh, nice. Um, and can I just say what I love is I'm barely into it. So that's all. Okay. Have me back on. I'll tell you more. But I love the table of contents. Thank you. Because I'm going to read it, but later I'm going <laughs> to want to be able to go to it and get an answer. And I don't want to read the whole thing again. So honestly, having a table of contents to help me get to uh, the question, the lesson, the method that I need is just incredible. Now, I got I to ask a follow up question. Do you read a lot of books that don't have a table of contents? Because for me, it's like par for the course. You know, there's the dead giveaway. I'm audio books mostly. <laughs> and so there is no table of contents. OK, well, we're going to we'll fix that for you, Brian. I'll make that one. Yes, piece maybe that's the problem. Maybe I have a problem with audiobooks, And I mean, I know there is a table of contents you can get to, but yeah, I'll make sure to read the table of contents. I'll that's know. all it took. Yeah. Put a table of contents in. <laughs> I'm going to be a big fan. Five he stars on Amazon. I love it. We know that Brian has read one page in my book, so that is incredible. At well, least. I mean, I looked at it. Yeah, I know. I appreciate He's that. I looked I'm, at it. I'm, one page. I'm so humbled even that you just have a copy handy. It's like I'm not the only one that's ready to throw it up on camera at the drop of a hat. Yes. 
<laughs> no, I was I was excited because we did order um, ten copies, you know, here for the office. Not we are waiting for the audio book, but that way we can, uh, you know, be cool by association and hand them out. We have a whole uh, bookshelf of books that we we've read as a team, and then we hand out to people when they come in. So we'll add yours to the giveaway shelf. Oh, nice! I did um, snag some pictures. Get it fast too. enough. I said I, I, I snagged some pictures of your bookshelf, and uh, there's some titles on. Yeah, it's there. actually just to my right here, but yeah, it's off camera. No, it's off camera. People um, just be in suspense until we put it on social media. Yeah, there is a post because we buy our books from BetterWorldBooks.com, and uh, you know you've made it when your book has been discarded, donated, and can be resold on Better World oh, Books. I can't wait. You're making a difference when your book's been discarded and can be sold for five dollars. <laughs> so. Uh, but great, great cause that they offer there. And then, you know, we get lots of books we can give away. That's beautiful. It's always good to support an awesome cause. And Brian, you're definitely a giver. I think you, you left a couple things out of your introduction. We still need to know, like, how long you've been in the construction industry. Like, I'm I'm curious to hear it again. And I also want to know why building enclosure? Like, was it just out of love? Oh, yeah. Like, did you just inherit that? Did you just fall out of the sky fully ready to put on a rain suit and bring building enclosure to the world so that people could understand it. And people in the training that I got to participate in, A, it has humor all throughout, which is incredibly appreciated, especially when you're in design and construction where training and humor don't always go hand in hand on purpose, but there it's woven in throughout the entire thing, even down to the handouts, which I'm not going to spoiler alert. I'm not going to say what kind of images are there, but it is totally appropriate, and I think everyone that works in construction needs to absolutely go through this and experience what good training is. And you're going to come out of there with your hands dirty, maybe even get some water on you. <laughs> so if you do a good job, yeah. maybe there's no water if you do a good job, right? Right, Brian? Exactly. But, but if you mess it up, you if might. We've done our job. Well, we are working really hard to make it more accessible. So I just, I am going to just start right from the beginning. So the first job was actually at McDonald's, 14 and a half years old in San Diego and 375 an hour. And, and I look back at that now and realize, wow, I learned that they could teach any knucklehead <laughs> how to make a hamburger the exact same way. I mean, visual signs, you know, stuff on the, on the cart where you made it. And um, and then I learned very quickly that you're worth more than no, more that you know how to do. And um, I ended up at about 16 working for a painter in the neighborhood. And uh, he did me a tremendous service. He taught me very quick. There's a brain book by a brain author who I can't can't cite. This is terrible. I'm not even going to do it. OK, but, uh, <laughs> Just butcher but they scanned no, no, all Brian, the painters. This is, Brian, this is what you do. You butcher it and you ask the people I'm going to butcher it to say and give us a comment. If you know what Brian's talking about. Make a comment and give us the answer so we can know. Yes. The it's comment the genius is going of the crowd. to be, everyone knows what he's talking about. This guy's a world famous uh, scientist. He invented the brain scan where they scan your brain and they check for blood flow. And he became famous because he could scan a psychopath and see that the empathy portion of the brain had no blood flow. It just wasn't active. Mm. And the thought was like, oh, this will be great for criminal defense, right? It's not his fault. And, and really, he's an advocate of treatment, you know, treatment through naturopathic through exercise and then chemical if necessary and, and tracking and seeing does the blood flow increase in that area. So it actually caused me to have a lot more empathy towards others, understanding that we are all working with, you know, the chemistry and the level of blood flow to different parts of our brain that, that we have. And uh, also encouraged me that you can start to develop those more as time goes on. But uh, they, they, you know, they just scan people for whatever experiment they felt like proving and they scanned all these painters and the portion of their brain that controls um, impulse gets far less blood flow probably from all the oil-based paint fumes and all the other <laughs> vocs that they you know the painter i worked for used to paint in the garage with the door closed wow. and uh you know couldn't move his arms after a while so they scan the painters and they no blood flow to that impulse control and apologies to the painting industry, but I think there's been great advances in awareness of what toxic fumes can do to your brain. And hopefully we're all in well-ventilated areas now, but that was my first job. I told you all that to tell you this, that was my first job. And he told me, started me at $6 an hour. And he said, if you can learn to cut in left-handed with a brush, I'll pay you seven. Wow. If you can learn to spray without leaving lines, I'll pay you eight. And so I worked my way up there. And then I ended up working for a 
general contractor. He was just getting his start at like 23, 24 years old. So we worked um, on like slumlord projects. You know, the, to- the toilet had fallen through the floor. Yeah. Go fix it. And um, so I got to do a lot of uh, repair work, you know, windows, leaky roofs. And then he started building ground up new homes, just beautiful custom homes in San Diego. And we would form the concrete, frame the walls, install the windows. Um, Southern California, the framers did windows. So that's my building envelope start. You know, we would tear out windows that leaked and he would just be, you know, talking and telling me about it. And uh, he'd learn from his dad. And then we'd put new windows in and he'd say, it has to be done this way to work. It's got to overlap. It needs to this. We seal these up. We don't nail in the corners uh, because it breaks the flange and the seal of the window. And uh, that was my exposure to enclosures. Tore off asphalt roofs and put new roofs on and all before 20 years old because I liked it so much. I would find a way to get early release in school. I even got the athletic director and the principal to sign these papers that would let me go to the community college for my last math and English class my senior year, but still play sports and go to prom. And then I would work Monday, Wednesday, Friday in construction. Always planned on being an accountant because I was good at math, (laughs) right? That was the logic. Are you still good at math? So um, I'm still pretty good at math, but uh, love building enclosure. I love doing something that I'm good at. Um, we've, We've just been talking here that if you can do meaningful work, that you enjoy with people you love, that's it. And I believe there are, you know, there's more than one meaningful work out there for me. There's probably more than one thing that I enjoy. And uh, I was lucky to put those together in building enclosure and in construction. I love to build. And now I work with people I love. And so life is good. And it shows, it comes through, like in all the stuff that you do. And and, the, and I like it too, that you've got some uh, family working in the office and the familial relations are not strained. Yes. <laughs> Which yes, is a he plus. didn't spare me any heckling, and we love that about him. When you talk about um, leadership teams needing to hold each other accountable, put a sibling on the team. They will hold you accountable. Absolutely. And I, and I, I didn't even realize it right away until uh, we, we went around the room and did introductions. And I said, oh, there's that guy. There's that. that well, guy. at least he didn't think that uh, he was my son. That, <laughs> that's been getting old, but I think he's finally <laughs> aging enough. There's only a five-year difference. But yeah, uh, yeah Sean, Sean's incredible and uh, lucky to have him as part of this team. He's uh, He went up through a very different route, but the same route in construction. So he... He benefited that his last um, construction experience before here was working with a master carpenter. You know, the type of people that would like put a piece of wood in a room before they built around it and then work on it because it wouldn't fit through the door later. Like he's truly the craftsman in the family and grateful to have him. It's incredible. It explains like all the cool custom stuff that's in and around the shop. Very visual too, which is, I mean, you're, you're living and breathing just tons of lean construction principles in your shop and how you teach and engage with the students. I'm in a class, you know, randomly just dropped in, welcomed with open arms by the rest of the the class that had been going on, right? And there was an inspector and there were superintendent people. But the most exciting part for me, Brian, is because you know that I love Scrum, probably only close to like a Jeff Sutherland level of like love for the the system. But uh, I got like butterflies in my stomach when we came in and everyone like went to the front and we had like a daily huddle or is what I like oh, to, yeah. the daily scrum. And we just, everyone checked in and we scrum. went, Oh, it, it, it was so fascinating to see and be part of that daily scrum. That was the first ever one. Well, you're there. So <laughs> we chime in. Yeah. And it ended at seven fifteen, didn't it? It did. And we added 20 people to our daily huddle and we ended it right on time. That was the first time uh, we've actually done that. We, we always do our huddle at seven o'clock. Everybody participates remote, uh, in person. Um, we strive for in person, but, um, we, when we would do our training that would start at seven o'clock, we would dance around it. You know, the, whoever wasn't participating in the training, um, would go and have a huddle quietly in a room somewhere with half of the team. And, um, it was just kind of an epiphany of wait, let's show this to the world and let's stop doing ourselves a disservice. I mean, we missed it on Friday. It was like, well, we didn't have the huddle yesterday. So (laughs) Thursday was a waste. Uh, It really wasn't that bad, but it was, you know, we noticed when half the team was missing from the huddle 
And so you were there for the first one where we just decided, just have our normal huddle. The world will benefit from being a part of it. And these are construction leaders. We learned from a native Texan how to pronounce yes. what city correctly? Waxahachie. 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 It's not even spelled yeah. the way you think it is. In in defense of Joanna, who's uh, who works with us in Texas, they abbreviate it all the time, the hospital W-A-X. And so that gets your brain saying wax. And if you haven't been there yet, you go Waxahachie, but never again, because we were corrected with love. Waxahachie. Waxahachie. Yeah, let us know in the comments if we're saying this right. Waxahachie, folks, let us know. I know. Send, send it to us with love. We like to be corrected in, in the in the nicest, kindest, gentlest way. Right, Brian? Yes. We will We will adapt, and we will get, get, you get the pronunciation. You throw a little right. twang, and everything sounds kind. Yeah. We, I love it there. Y'all, just help us out, y'all. We need your help. <laughs> Maybe I'll have to phone Steve Turner, which is phone a friend and be like, hey, Steve, are we yes. saying this well, right? Well, I'm inspired that I just listened to Steve on your podcast and, and he had me inspired. So yeah, what no. did he say? A uh, four to five hour drive in Texas is we just call that going to lunch. That <laughs> might have been your joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. I will drive, Brian, five hours for a meal. And there'll be some audio books and some podcasting that happens on the way to that meal. Or if you know, my family's in the car, I'll, I'll tell them all about this latest documentary I just watched. <laughs> which... Yes. <laughs> it'll does. be longer than the documentary yeah it'll i told tell you how you felt about it yeah and, you know I'm like, it takes me more to explain it to you than we could just watch it together when we get home and uh, i was I, I had a rare moment uh at the house by i've got four children lovely wife and and she was uh out moving one of them from one sporting event to the other and two of them had gone to bed and the other was also at a sporting event and i was sitting there like i should relax a little bit i've heard people do this <laughs> So I did. I turned on, I think it was Hulu, and a documentary popped up, and I was like, I should try these out for Felipe. Yeah. That was as far as I got. I ended up with, you know, Brooklyn Nine-Nine instead. Oh. But still. Well, I mean, that's the meditation. Yeah, I can't be, you know, I was trying to meditate and relax. I can't be fully engaged in a riveting documentary. I know. I know the feeling. I've never been able to watch a documentary and just be like, chill. Chill and documentary yes. for me just don't go hand in hand. And people are like, what kind of weird that, life do you have? <laughs> It's, if it's, you want life to slow down, watch World War II in color. Okay. I'm not They're gonna... like 40 minute episodes that last like three hours. <laughs> Is there a lot of recap? I don't know how they do it. I just know I'm two episodes in and I've watched it like eight different nights. Wow. <laughs> You're only in episode yes. two. Wow. World War II in color. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably not dig into that one because I don't want to get caught and then be stuck watching it for like six months. Right. To go a little bit deeper on field verified and your your background in accounting, one of the things that I noticed is that you have this uncanny talent to know the cost of things, and you calculate you know business decisions very quickly in your mind. Can you share how you you've made that into like a game? You've gamified that ability for your team, if you don't mind. Oh, it's beautiful. I thought you were going to ask me how I you know got to that point, and I was just like, how how did I develop this? And uh, I. I'd love to say oh, I was born with it. This is, you know, God's gift to the world. But I think it was playing Lemonade Stand on an Apple IIe computer from an early age. Wow. And, you know, making those decisions about what price I should sell my lemonade cup for based on the demand and the temperature and the cost of products. But um, uh, similarly, you know, that's something that people actually play in. And even now it's in the App Store. And uh, so naturally we like to keep track and measure progress and see things um, you know, raise in value and our same level of effort produce more value. That's the, I mean, this is scrum. This is the magic, that's so right. I'm, I want you to say that three times in this yeah. podcast, that would make it for uh, me. When you get done so explaining seeing, it, I'll just say, this is scrum. <laughs> this is scrum. Seeing an increase of value from the same level of effort, this is scrum. This is scrum. We didn't think we were gamifying it. Um, I may not reuse that phrase because it, <laughs> It sounds a little bit like we need to make it simple, but we need to make it simple. And and everyone loves points. This is science. Insert random reference to nonspecific brain scientists right here. Yeah. Um, we <laughs> love points. We love keeping score. And so we took an increment of money and um, call it $1,000, and we gave it po a point value of one point. And it's tricky because here we have services as consultants. Um, we have lump sum services in design um, document review for the building enclosure. We do a, an AMA 501.2 hose test. We do a roof moisture scan. It sounds like I'm plugging all of the things that we do, but 
you know, everything we do here. Oh, it's going to help us understand the pointing. Right. We've got full scale mockups that are built in the yard, testing that we do there, um, windows that are tested here for certification, um, electronic leak detection. They're all priced differently. Some are per square foot, some are by the hour, some are lump sum. And of course, they're all different values. If everything was $1,000, that would be great. We'd count how many things we did and we'd kind of see, be able to project the week and the month. But instead, we took an increment, gave it one point, and then certain activities we've just designated as, you know, that type of a test is three points, that type of a test is one point, uh, a site visit is one point, and, um, and then we can plan out our week, and as divisions, when those plans are made, they can actually project, like, oh, we're looking at 18 points as a division this week. That's great. Let's get out there. We don't know what grade is because we've only just begun tracking these things, but we do know what we've uh, done previously. Everything you just described, this is Scrum. This is Scrum. It's beautiful because it makes it accessible. And so the other reason, the big reason we wanted to track it is not to say, look, you've got to get 20. Don't come back till you find a way to get 20 points this week. It's because we already know that the people that we have here are giving their best effort. There's total willingness. There's total buy-in. And you always get their best effort. So let's measure what that is and see if we can improve it with the same level of effort. And so when phone calls come in and there's immediate testing needed, we swarm that need. We make sure everybody's trained to do everything so we can quickly address issues. And we might take 18 planned for the week and jump it to 24. And instead of just sitting in the next meeting going, wow, we had some stuff come in last minute. That was pretty cool. Nice work, guys. We can say, wow, we had a 25% increase from what we thought our week would be. And we thought it was a full week. Nobody worked overtime. Nobody worked on Saturday. We were efficient as a team and we hit 24. And the consulting division has the same opportunity. So firefighter calls come in, you know, those emergency calls that they need testing or they need you on site for a first work because it's construction. Uh, schedules change. Sometimes they accelerate, sometimes they delay. And so we have to adjust all the time too. And this gives us the ability to measure by division and then also by a company as a company by week, by month, by day, uh, however we choose, it's now accessible at every level. Don't be tempted to bonus people on things like this. This is a measuring process for us to celebrate the wins together and have awareness of where we are. There we go. So I, I wanna showcase three things there that you talked about. Number one, obviously this is Scrum. It goes, almost goes without saying, but we're gonna just beat it, beat it in. You mentioned cross training. So cross-training your people across on the consulting side into the different types of tests that you do because people have to be qualified and trained to do those things. Not anybody can just you know slap on a badge and walk into a site and be able to do a water test appropriately. I mean, there are people out there that just get a weed blower and try to do these types of things, but that's not in commercial construction going to cut it for what we need to have something survive you know, the test of time and pass, go way past the 10-year latent defect window to have it be a nice performing watertight building or in some cases some envelopes are designed to leak and breathe but just perform per what it's designed to do so that number one cross-functional team is going to be big that's that's one way that if you're listening to this and you have a business or you're part of a team take that nugget from brian i told you in the beginning that brian was going to drop nuggets there is a super high value nugget that is available to everybody listening to this show right now. If you can cross train your people, when someone goes on vacation or they get sick or as other people level up their skills, you can level up everybody's skills so that people can pitch in. So when those last minute calls come in from especially general contractors, like there's a lot of variables in construction and site conditions do change and you have to be able to adapt. When you guys can respond to those emergencies with anybody on your team, you only can do that because of the cross training. So cross training, right. definitely foundational to a good scrum team or it will increase your capacity without adding people. And there's, there's a scrum principle for you, right? There it what is. should be our first step. We want, if we want a 25% increase in production of testing and consulting, the answer is not to hire more testing technicians or consultants. It's to uh, level them up so that we have more capacity with our current staff. That's right. You focus on flow with your people. Where are our gaps? Where are our skills at? How can we make this process better? Even like what you mentioned in the beginning, like, do we put these mock-ups in a bin 
and then have the waste of people having to pull them in and out of bins or we just showcase them on the wall, you know, make it more visual, make it easy, more right. easily accessible, less wasted motion of human beings because we only have so much time in the day, Brian. This is why I scrum everything. Well, you know, look how sexy the wall is behind us now, but don't look at that and think this is lean. Lean is that they were in a box before and we looked at it and thought, I bet we could do something better here. What do we think we could do better? And three people stood and they talked it out. And it was five minutes later that this idea came up. And then I walked away and left it to Sean and his brilliance. And then Sean detailed exactly what needed to happen, showed someone how to do it. And then we both walked away and came back a couple of days later. It didn't take a couple of days, but a couple of days later, it had fit into our flow. Some of the staff here, it was Manny. Manny got all of these up on the wall and uh, hung the way that we liked them. So... Uh, lean is the process of ex doing the best with what you have and then asking yourself, how could this be better? But, but accepting the pace of it also, right? We didn't just say, forget all the work that we have to do, our real job. That's right. And let's get these things hung on the wall. So that is Scrum. We put it in the backlog. We taught someone uh, else how to do it. And then we let that flow. Autonomous. Or if you got Sean, who's like a master carpenter in your in your squad obviously you want yep. to have him weigh in on you know what's the i'm sure there's a french cleat involved in this hanging of some of this there stuff. is there is a french cleat yes. <laughs> yes and the sign just above it here there's yes. a french cleat. well and riley who's our logistics master you know as he's exposed to scrum and he'll be doing your uh scrum master certification soon oh quick plug for me i passed my scrum master hey congratulations just, just you're now time. yes leave Brian. yourself plenty of time yeah Brian, you are now a registered <laughs> Scrum Master. Exactly. Now, it's really tempting, and sometimes I think when you talk about lean, you can get burnt out on the energy of the people that are like, oh, look, we did this, and we did this, and we cross-train everyone. Because I think, you know, I feel a little guilty as you're talking about how beautifully we cross-train everyone, because in the back of my mind is we have an incredible employee, you know, I'm Dallin Worthington. He interned here on four separate stints, and on all four... This genius shut down additional training for him because he was just an intern Ooh. and we didn't know if he would be back. Okay. Now he's here, the whole life ahead of him. Uh, he's part of the brilliance behind the training uh, program. He's a, a organizational psychology major. Anytime I do bad uh, bossing, <laughs> anytime I do uh, behave poorly as a leader, he can't help but let out like a little like, like chuckle. He's this... <laughs> <laughs> audible conscience where I'm like, well, I did that wrong. So I'll hear that and try to rephrase what I did. But uh, we just missed the boat. And we, you know, he wasn't the only intern that came through. And uh, when we figured out, oh my gosh, Dallin's here. He's a full-time employee now. We wasted so much human potential there. Uh, we should have taught him from the get-go. Now, the second you come in, whether, whether you're a summer intern or not, we teach you as though you're going to be here. Um, forever. And so we invest in that training and it pays itself back immediately. You know, there were, there are reports that we produced from some of our tests that were like, that young person couldn't do that tough computer work. Like, come on, how, what a terrible, <laughs> terribly foolish statement that is from, you know, someone in their forties to think a 20 year old isn't capable of managing Bluebeam, right? Um, right? And so now we take advantage of that. We realize the human potential and just doing that, I think we probably jumped our capacity 10 or 15 percent, just realizing that we should be training new hires faster. This is Scrum. This is Scrum. Using the same team and going and increasing your point value or your value delivery to your client. You focused on flow. And so you're thinking intuitively, you didn't say it out loud, but as you're talking, it just like triggered me to think that you're thinking downstream, like there are people waiting for our services that depend on us that have a need. You know, whether it be a testing service or a constructability review or even the training so they can get the skills to manage this stuff properly in real life yes. where there are all these variables. Focusing on that flow and from and making it everything better from the client's perspective is something that's so often overlooked. And we, we hear this, you know, negativity sometimes in the continuous improvement space where people talk about, you know, lean burnout because people start to start I mean, they get started improving everything. And some things are not valuable. So I like it that you always come back and there's a conversation, a dialogue with, with people of various different experiences 
and a thoughtfulness on who's going to benefit from what we're doing. And then that's a good, yeah. that's a good way. Like, ladies and gentlemen, that is one of the secrets to improving your flow is think from the client's perspective, not your perspective. Like when Brian and I were first starting this, like if you look at Brian on camera and you see he's got uh, only one earbud in his ear, that was because there's, there's the beautiful ear, there's the bud. He needed to hear himself properly. And I said, Brian, I'm not going to sacrifice your sound for yourself just so that I can selfishly say we're earbud buddies. That's not necessary. Like, go ahead yes. and remove that bud and <laughs> so you can hear yourself and get after it. Quality of life. Quality of life, man. It's so important. What are the secret sauce items here? And, and shout out to Dr Jason Schroeder, who consulted to us really early on and just like dumped knowledge on us. We have the we have our morning huddle because after he gave me 10,000 pieces of advice, I said, what's the one thing we can do? And he'd already mentioned morning huddle and I'd already dismissed it as impossible. And he said, the most meaningful you, thing you can do is have a daily huddle with your team. And so we started it. One day we'll share the video is one year ago today. And it was oh, wow. rough to get through. <laughs> but uh, if we can focus on the value, you know, he had us writing uh, our secret sauces. And if you Google it and look it up, which I did before I started recording um, nice. all of these videos, first video is what is a secret sauce? And I was like, oh. Webster's Dictionary says, and this is what it says, that a secret sauce is something that makes you more efficient, a company more efficient, and and adds value to the client or the customer. And so, you know, those are our favorite secret sauce items here, are the things that we're like, look, you're going to, your day's going to be better and your client's going to be happier. What it's more do you win. want? Yeah, it's win-win. This is Scrum. That is Scrum. Um, we've had a lot of things where we do them because they're tradition, or we've seen other people do them, and then we stop and we analyze, well, what's the most valuable thing to the client? And for us, the highest value we bring to the client is trust and honesty, like clarity of what is the issue. Probably not honesty. It's not a lot of people lying about your building and closure issues, but clarity is a big struggle. Yeah. So prompt clarity on what the issues are and how to correct those. And, uh, you know, we get to go through our day finding problems and helping to solve them. So uh, it feels pretty good. It's addicting. It's a, it's a fun way to go through and, and make a living. But I wanted to circle back on you, Brian, because you do have all this experience and you're, you're running a team that's uh, not always together. Sometimes they, they travel and you go all over the country. How far away does the team go, like currently? Uh, we try to go where, anywhere southwest will go nonstop. That's okay, kind so, of a good rule of thumb. Oh man, so that's the a, Western United States. Right? Yeah. yeah. That's very Get rid good. of that flight to Newark. We're not going that way. Um, no. What about Hawaii? We've got, we've, will you go to Hawaii? Well, we should go to Hawaii. Southwest goes to Hawaii. It's, it's in the West. Yeah, they do now. But you have to stop in Oakland from Phoenix. So. Oh, okay. That's Apparently, that's why we don't go there. <laughs> that's well, my the, one rule. The, so, no, we are, we are across California, <laughs> um, heavy in Utah and Texas. Uh, we'll work with our clients in New Mexico and... And really what's been great about focusing on our clients and their successes is this is not a big market that we're a part of. There's not, you know, 500 companies. There's probably not even 100 companies. Um, and so we do, if we can, and we preach this here, if you can do a good job for the individuals that you're working for, everyone on the project, everyone wins, then on the next job, they're not going to mess with it. And so we work really hard to make sure that everyone wins. So we'll, we'll work for owners, architects, and general contractors. And it really doesn't matter who we're working for on a given project, because as long as the building doesn't leak and everyone gets there on time and on budget without, you know, the issues we find slowing people down, right? And you can slow people down by not giving it in a prompt manner or by finding issues that you don't have any idea how they can fix or take the time to help them fix. And if you can focus on, hey, everyone here wins when this building doesn't leak and we all keep moving and you provide that clarity, then what your value is as a consultant and a testing agency becomes really clear. It's not, oh, great, they failed. Cha-ching, let's get some more tests. It's, okay, they failed. How can we help identify this issue? And we go through the process. They find it and a terrible day turns into a salvageable day that they can react to and move forward. So the value wasn't, you know, write a 90 page report, the value was stay there, get answers, then provide a report right afterwards to document. So we adjusted um, our priorities where the industry would tell us, oh, experts give reports. No, great experts solve problems. 
And that doesn't happen in a report. That's correct. So we've had a shift as a company to just always ask, well, what are we trying to do? Even Saturday testing, you know, sometimes we get asked to test on Saturday because testing can slow down the pace of a project. So our ability to respond quickly can actually keep a project on, on schedule or even move it up if they had slotted out you know, two weeks for someone else to do the testing and we're able to do it immediately. You just got your time back. You can cover your waterproofing, start hanging your drywall, whatever it might be. We get a call and it's like, hey, I need you here Saturday. Okay, well, let's talk to the client and see why they need us there Saturday. Well, because Monday at eight o'clock, they're going to be covering it up. Great. Well, it's a two hour test. If we're there Monday at five, will that work? Yeah, that will work. So where you want to be client centric and just say, yes, 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 we'll be there Saturday. And then you have to turn to your team and be like, who who just got punked because I was being client centric? What we do in focusing on that value is we figure out, hey, the problem that can actually be solved a different way that isn't detrimental to the quality of life of our employees. So we look where that value is and, hey, who wants to come in Monday at 5 a.m. instead of Saturday? Everybody. <laughs> I'm, I'll be there. I'll be there Monday at 5 a.m. instead of that moment of like, we need two people for Saturday. So um, I love just that slowing down and identifying the value or that minimum viable product. Yeah, this is Scrum. This is field verified. Brian, across your entire organization, you included, especially, you've built a learning organization where people are just fanatical on picking up new things. And I can't even walk through your shop and not just see all this evidence of the learning that's happening with everybody. And as you're describing this approach, I mean, it's just embodied into everything you're doing with the win-win. Now, I think it's it's important to say that to have that mindset, luckily for you and all of us listening, we work in a very challenging environment. Construction is not easy. Design is not easy. It's complicated at best. It's almost always complex. And so I think it's really important to have that proper challenge and a good challenge will help people, you know, get addicted to problem solving in a, in a positive way that doesn't burn people out, that enables people to grow professionally. And you've had a lot of people grow in your organization and sometimes people move on. And I just want to, I don't want to let the listeners not get the wisdom that's, that's locked up in there. If I want to ask you this question, Brian, what piece of advice or guidance would you give to somebody who's feeling frustrated or jammed up? as in an improperly cocked window weep. Do you like how I, you like how I worked in that enclosure well on there, Brian? Well done. Thank you. Yeah, I, I heard a story once that uh, half of, I don't know, terrible reference again. <laughs> half of the world's 90%, I don't know, you pick a number. But the, the moral of the story was how many millionaires now had filed bankruptcy at one point in their lives. And, and I look at, you know, these were words of encouragement as I failed in entrepreneurship and then, you know, launched onto the next thing from a, from a fellow entrepreneur. And I think that that applies to lean, you know, for every lean champion that is out there, there is an ugly bankruptcy and it might take seven years to get off the record, but, um, we want to inspire the world. So we don't talk about those moments. Uh, we've all felt frustrated with things we've tried to implement with, things we tried to understand and teach to other people. You know, our biggest failing at Field Verified was my inability to teach effectively. And we had to overcome that and we're still working to overcome it. I've, thankfully, I've got, you know, Dallin just behind me to remind me when he's like, that was not an effective way to teach. Uh, your true nature just came out is what he's really saying. Um, because my true nature is to be impatient and I'd rather do it myself because I like to build and get things done. And so, that urge to complete something myself turns into just get out of the way. Um, and about a year ago, I realized that the rest of my life is teaching. And the better I can get at that, the better everyone around me will be. And I can start to take joy in what they build as I build them. And that's really, we've had to do that as enclosure consultants too. And, and we all do this on a building. We don't build the whole building, but we can look at that building and feel pride in what's been done by the entire team that worked on it. Absolutely, that's well said. I, I like how you got uh, a little vulnerable there and exposed some truth and some real growth. I think that's the only way that it can happen, Brian. I was hoping I was the only one that could hear my voice shaking there, but um, it really it really takes a moment of understanding and accepting that you are going to fail. And um, I think the world, when you figure this out, when you figure out lean and what it can do and all these little things like, 
icebreakers and meetings that help people connect as individuals. You figure it out and you believe it. And then it seems like the whole world is trying to stop you <laughs> because <laughs> the world is not lean and the world is not people centric and the world is not about teaching. And so, yes, the habits of the world are trying to stop you. And um, you just can't get caught up in that. You live it and believe it and you will find those people that believe it with you and and grow together. Uh, one of the one other nugget I'd like to just volunteer without it being probed is uh, if you are feeling discouraged with lean and just with self-improvement, with continuous improvement in your own life, then go handpick your tribe. Go handpick the people that will lift you up. And my advice is that you find people, and I think I've done this. We've named all these people who are my <laughs> friends and each one of them I feel you know, unqualified and unworthy to list as friends. But that's how you know I've done a great job picking my tribe because you want a tribe that you're going to try to live up to. Um, and that's gonna turn to you and tell you, you're amazing, you have nothing you need to improve on. Um, because you need that constant support and encouragement and you need those role models and you need people to celebrate with. So if you're getting worn out with lean, find other people who are champions of it. Um, you're going to sit down and you're gonna share the failures as much as the successes. But you have to have failures. That's continuous improvement. What would there be to improve on if we didn't have any failures? It would be like instant perfection. <laughs> it's like Jason Sign always says. Sign me up says. for that one. Yeah, Jason always says, like, if, if that was what heaven was like, we'd all be bored to tears in a day. And we'd want oh, yeah. to start, we'd start making problems just so that we have something to do. No, we're going to be up there in heaven together going, you know what would make this better? And then, and then we would break it out. And then, Q, and then I'd have no, and then I'd have post notes appear in my hand, and we'd start doing, we'd scrum it. Yeah, <laughs> Brian, that was an amazing nugget. I want to give you the last word, so you get the last word, my friend. But I want to thank you so very much for coming onto the show, and dropping some wisdom with the audience, and encouraging people to exercise their ability to leave comments and give us answers to the questions that we couldn't answer or the references that we missed. Yes. So thank you, everyone for helping us in advance. We appreciate you. Yes, and shout out to Waxahachie. I'm humbled to be here. Um, proud of your new book. Can't wait for the world to see it. And uh, thanks for having me. That's the last word. Very special thanks to my guest. I'm Felipe Engineer Manriquez. The EBFC show is created by Felipe and produced by a passion to build easier and better. Thanks for listening. Stay safe, everybody. Let's go build. <laughs>